hardest uh, scriptures in it of anywhere in the New Testament. And you might say, well, preacher, I've read Matthew and I didn't see nothing in there so hard. Well, you read that thing close and look at it and you're going you're gonna to get stumped uh, a bunch of times unless you understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. So you stay with me tonight. And I'm going to read you some of the um, most difficult scripture in the New Testament. And then we're going to make a few comments on it. I don't claim to have all the answers by no means. Uh, but I do claim to have a teacher who does. The Holy Spirit. The Bible says He'll lead you into all truth. And He'll shed light on the Word of God as we look at it and study it and pray and compare. What I do when I'm, when I'm trying to understand the Scripture, I'll look at it first. If I can't make no sense out of it, I'll run some references. If I can't make no sense out of it, I get commentaries. I think God's give a lot of good men, a lot of good light that it wouldn't hurt us a bit to listen to. I've heard people say, I don't believe in reading books. Well, you're just cheating yourself out of labor, of thousands of hours of labor that a lot of great men have put in. That don't mean they're right, but it, you do yourself a favor to listen to what they say. I, listen, I read two or three commentaries, and if I still ain't satisfied, I'll get down and pray about it again. And if I still ain't satisfied, I'll let it go. A year, six months later down the road, I'll try it again. And in one of these days, when the Lord's ready, that thing's going to click. Now, uh, you're not going to understand all the Bible overnight. Don't expect to. When you first start studying the Bible, it's vague. It, it's it's kind of shadowy, but it begins to clear up. The longer you're saved, the more you study, it starts clearing up. One of these days, you'll be sitting in church somewhere, and a preacher will come across something, and it'll go bang. And you'll say, well, I'll be. There's what that scripture meant. Has that ever happened to you? That's a blessing when it happens. And then once you know it and you know it's God, then you're settled in it and you don't have to worry about it. I have heard some people, here's the, here's the lazy man's way out. He goes off to a camp meeting and here's a preacher priest. And he says, bless God so and so said. And he believes that until he goes and hears somebody else preach. And then they say something else. And here he goes off on that belief. And then he goes and hears another great man who God has used. And he says something else and he takes off on that belief. Now, you need to remember that great men are not always wise, the Bible said. I'll listen to anybody preach. Man, I'll listen to anybody preach. But when it comes right down to it, I'm going to check it out with a book. And let God be true and every man a liar. That's what we're going to do here tonight. Here we go. Matthew chapter 11. Now hold your Bibles open because we'll be running a lot of scripture references. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. If you had to write an essay on this verse, I'd like for you to hear it. For, to hear it. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That's one of the most difficult passages of Scripture anywhere in the New Testament. That's a hard Scripture, brother. What in the world does that mean? The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, to understand this scripture tonight, we're going to have to back up a little before it and go a little after it. It really gets wild after that. Look at verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied, all the Old Testament prophets, until John. And we believe that John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He is the middleman. He is the bridge coming from Old Testament and New Testament. And look at verse 14. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. There the Lord Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah. Elias is the Greek translation of the Elijah of the Old Testament, Hebrew translation. It's pronounced Elijah in the Old Testament. It's pronounced Elias in the New Testament. Same fella. And Jesus said that John the Baptist, he said, if you'll receive it, that's Elijah that's supposed to come before the second coming of, uh, of the kingdom comes. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Ain't no wonder he said that. You better watch out how you listen. You better take heed how you hear. Now look, let's back up there at verse number uh, uh, 7 when he begins to be talking about John the Baptist. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, 
What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with a wind? John wasn't no sissy. John wasn't a wimp. A reed shaken with a wind? Don't point his finger in the king's face and tell him he's committing adultery by marrying his brother's wife. A reed shaken with a wind? Don't do that. He was a man. What went ye out to see? Verse 8. A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Verse 10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, back in Isaiah and Malachi, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Well, look at this one. Here's one for you. Verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Everybody that's born of a woman, none of them is greater than John the Baptist. But, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. All right? To, the, to look at this scripture a little bit tonight, you feel free to raise your hand and ask questions anytime you want to now. Uh, we're going to start back and make a comment back at verse number 10. Where he said, this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face. Just in passing, I want to show you something here. Everybody knows that scripture there, prophesied back in Isaiah and Malachi. But let's turn, hold your finger there and turn back to Malachi chapter 3. And let me show you a great verse um, that'll bless your heart. Now we know that John the Baptist was the messenger sent before Jesus Christ and he come before Jesus Christ as a messenger to prepare like God's bulldozer. That'd be a good message from you preachers to preach on. God's bulldozer. Every mountain will be made low and the crooked will be made. John just come through and plowed it up and got it ready for the Lord. That's what we ought to be. Matthew chapter 11 said, uh, he said, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. See? But notice what it says in Malachi. I will send chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm sorry. Chapter 3, Malachi 3, 1. Here's the prophecy. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before who? Me. That's Jehovah speaking in the Old Testament. That's quoted in Matthew. Jehovah said in the Old Testament, John, he said, John's going to come, my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Do you realize what you just read? You just read that the Jehovah God of the Old Testament is the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. He said, he's going to come prepare his way before me. That's God. Jesus Christ was God. That was Jesus Christ talking there in Malachi 3. You can't separate God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. When one of them's a talking, they're all a talking. When one of them's a working, they're all a working. You either got all three of them or you ain't got neither one of them. I've heard people say, well, I've got God and then I'm going to get the Holy Ghost. If you ain't got the Holy Ghost, you ain't got God. He said that his messenger's going to come before my face. Now, that's, of course, is John. Now, let's tackle verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, anybody that's got a woman for their mother, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. In other words, he said, there ain't never been nobody with a woman for their mother that's greater than John the Baptist. But the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Now, this brings up all kinds of things. It brings up one thing is that everybody in the kingdom ain't equal, right? The least person is greater than John. So there's some people in the kingdom of heaven that have a less position than others. We're not Mormons. We don't believe in seven different heavens people go to. There's only one heaven you go to. Now, the problem comes up. There's uh, two ways of looking at this scripture here. There's... Uh, Pages and pages and pages wrote in commentaries over this. You look at commentaries and they just go on and on and on and on and on. But uh, there's two things you need to remember. One, uh, this scripture implies that the people of the kingdom of heaven are not born of women or else they're in a different dispensation or group that John was in, right? Which, of course, they are. A different setup, unknown to John. Now, 
he, he either meant one or two things when he said this. He either meant, like most people around here believe, most people in this uh, part of the country believe, that he that is least in the kingdom of God, um, I've heard most preachers preach that, and they'll preach that when a man's saved and born again, that he, w- he is greater than John the Baptist, because anybody who's born again is in a higher position than John was being an Old Testament prophet, which is true. That is true. John chapter 1 verse 13 tells about being born again. 1 Peter 1 23 says we're born not of corruptible seed, but of incorrupt. We're born of the word of God, not born of a woman, right? So when you're saved, you're born of the word of God. But there's a problem with that. You've got to be careful forcing the church into a verse of scripture that says kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven in the scripture is different from the church. It doesn't say the church, it says the kingdom of heaven. Brother John just brought the lesson here a few weeks back on the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Sometimes they're synonymous in the scripture, but they're always different. I mean, the kingdom of heaven is a literal, visible, physical kingdom that you can walk in and touch and feel of. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of heaven has streets and a throne and a king sitting on it, and it's literally going to come one of these days. So the kingdom of heaven is not the church. John, John came preaching, and you know what John said when he came preaching? He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I'm going to lay something heavy on you right here, and I just want you to think about it. I don't say you have to agree with me. I don't even know if I agree with me. But this is, this is just something that you begin to see as you study the Scripture a lot. You study the Scripture a lot, and you see how that God had His Word laid out so that if things go a different way than they did, He could have still fulfilled it and not interfere with man's free will. That means this. That means God don't make men do nothing. God prophesies the way it's going to go, and then whichever way man goes, God fulfills His Word a different way. For example, could the Jews have received Jesus and believed His message that He was Messiah? Could they? Sure they could have. They absolutely could have. Now, what if they had have? Where would that have left all the Old Testament prophecies? If the Jews had have said, Yeah, I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you are the Savior. We believe you. You know what would have happened? The kingdom would have come right then in the book of Acts. The millennium would have began. And all the Gentiles is going to get saved would have got saved in the millennium with Christ on the throne in Jerusalem instead of getting saved in a 2,000 year grace age with Christ in heaven making intercession for us. God's going to still fulfill his prophecies. And John the Baptist would have been Elijah coming before the second coming of the Lord. You understand that? He would still died. He would still died, been crucified, resurrected, and come out and set up his kingdom. Wasn't that what John said? John didn't, when John the Baptist come preaching, he didn't say the kingdom of heaven is 2,000 years from now. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? And if they'd have believed that message, it would have been set up right then. Now, I'm just getting you to think for a second. You say, Brother Danny, there's no way. They, what you, you mean tell me they didn't have a choice? You mean they had to reject him? Mm-mm. They didn't have to reject him. Nobody has to reject God. You say, what about Pharaoh? Pharaoh hardened his heart first before the Lord ever hardened it. Pharaoh made the choice, then God hardened his heart. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But you are, look, you are forced to look beyond the church age where the kingdom of heaven is actually going to be set up on this earth and would have been if Israel had repented. And Jesus said, He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. He personally, I believe he was referring to the kingdom of heaven. Literal, visible kingdom in which people live and the least person in that kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. You say, Brother Danny, why do you believe he's referring to the kingdom of heaven? Because that's what he said. And I believe the Bible. You say, I ain't talking about Baptist doctrine. I'm talking about Bible. Bible. 
I believe he was referring to the kingdom of heaven because he said kingdom of heaven. All right, now there's verse 11. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So when the kingdom is set up, whether it would have been set up then or whether it be set up in the next thousand years, that's why nobody knows the date on the rapture. The Lord don't have to come at no certain time. He knows when he's coming. But he can, he can tack a few years. Let me give you an example. I mean, you believe, you believe that God's already got the day fixed when you're going to die? That's a tricky question, ain't it? Do you believe God knows when you're going to die? Right? All right, there's a man in the Old Testament. God says he's going to die. And he turned his face to the wall and prayed and God gave him 15 more years. Hezekiah, right? You can't box God in and say, he has to do this. He don't have to do nothing he don't want to do. And he'll still fulfill his word. With you, without you, or in spite of you. With man, without man, or in spite of man. We limit, we think, well, God's got to do this. He don't neither. He's like the lion in the forest, man. He does whatever he wants to do. And still God and still never breaks his word. All right, any questions so far on verse 11? I either explained it real good or not at all. Those Roman soldiers would have. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then that would have fulfilled Isaiah 53, by stripes were healed and all that kind of stuff. All I'm saying is, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that, then you believe that he had, that he had, the Jews had to reject him. And you can't believe that. That's heresy. Believing somebody had to reject him. That's not right. You say, well, what about all those Old Testament prophecies? God had a way of fixing every one of them where they can go either way. Brother Danny? There you go. That's it. There you go. That's it. There's your scripture, Acts chapter 7. When Stephen died, calling on God... Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. What do you think he is doing? Now, I've heard people say, oh, well, he's standing up welcoming a Christian home. If Jesus stood up every time a Christian died, he had never sat down. They die every second all over the world, two or three a second, see? He was getting ready to do something right there. That's when Israel officially rejected the message and it went the other way. And the door opened to Gentiles in the next chapter, Acts chapter 8. Brother Tony? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You're right. That would have fulfilled all Isaiah and all that. Then they'd have had a chance to receive him when, when they come guys preaching because they said, men, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. They could have had him right then as their Messiah. Anybody else right quick before we get on to the hard scripture? All right. Chapter, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Now, that wasn't too long, was it? The days of John the Baptist until now. What was that? Just a few, few months, few years there. Uh, ever how long John had been there? John was there six months before Jesus came. And, and Christ's ministry was three and a half years. Suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Uh, there's two... Uh, main interpretations of this verse. And neither one of them are easy to get a hold of. And I welcome your comments because I'm just a student of the Bible and I'd like to know what you think. But he says this, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by forth. force. Number one, meaning number one. Meaning number one would be it takes a, a violent pressing and determination of making your family mad at you and suffering ridicule and getting made fun of and everything to grab hold of the kingdom and uh, beyond the church age and fulfill Isaiah 11, Zechariah 13 about the kingdom and you really have to suffer to get into it. And the violent just take it by force. I don't care what I have to suffer. I'm going to get a hold of God and hang on to him. That type of definition. Or 
It means the other way around, just completely opposite, talking about unlawful usurpers of the kingdom, the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes there, Matthew chapter 21, um, where they took it by force, the, that they crucified the Lord of glory, that they took the kingdom, tried to take control of it, and put the king down. Now, there's the two definitions of that verse, and one of them sure ain't right. <laughs> That's completely two different ways of looking at it. Now, the second meaning of that verse on the unlawful usurpers of the kingdom, that means the kingdom is divided into three dispensations, the Old Testament prophets and law number one, the intermediate period there of John the Baptist number two, and the future period of the established kingdom at the second coming of Christ number three. And the violent... Take it by force. All right? Either that means that a person getting into the kingdom of God has got to really suffer and go through tribulation and fight for it and grab it and take it by force. Or it means the scribes and Pharisees took the kingdom and tried to take over it and kill the Messiah and all so forth and so on. Okay? Comments? Brother Tucker, what does that mean? Uh, he's a Bible scholar. He ought to know that. Brother John. They both sound good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which one you're going to throw out. Well, I think I'm going to throw number two out. I think, maybe. But I might be wrong. I don't know. I don't know. Either one of them. Anybody else? I'll tell you one thing. If a man wants in the kingdom of heaven, during the tribulation, he's going to have to get it. Grab it by force. That's right. That's right. He's got the mark of the beast. The Holy Spirit's gone. He's got to refuse the mark. He gets his head cut off. He can't buy or sell. Buddy, you're going to have to grab it before sin. But also, <laughs> those, the, those Pharisees and the rulers knew when they killed Jesus Christ that he was the heir to the throne. That's right. And see, that's, that's what that means, suffereth violence. It suffereth violence. And that gives uh, some meaning to, uh, to meaning number two. The kingdom of heaven suffers by Somebody's doing something to make it suffer. Anybody else? Danny Ledford's a Bible scholar. He knows Greek, Hebrew. No. <laughs> Over to Luke 16, 16, give the reference. It says uh, that time the king of God's priest never ran free. Mm -hmm. And the pocket Let's look at that right quick. Luke 16, 16. That's a good one. I'm glad you brought that up, brother. That's another verse that's always bothered me. Every time I've ever read that verse, it's, it bothers me. I just can't, it's like I can't get a hold of it. The, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. You have to fight to get into it? Sounds good. So you're saying number one. What about that, Relin? Yep. It's it's something that you're doing instead of God. Yeah. Well, what about the violence to suffer the violence? The kingdom of heaven suffer the violence. And the violent take it by force. <laughs> yeah. Man, I remember, ever since I've been saved when I read that, I just go, and then I go on. And I thought, I'll get it next time. And I read it again, I go, and I go on, you know. I mean, I've read these things here for years, but it's never really... Uh, reference over to Luke 5, 19, where they uh, lowered the man down to the house top. Yeah. They couldn't get in, so they forced their way through. They got the Jesus. That's good. Amen. So he pressed, they pressed him into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do in the bus ministry. We're pressing them in. We're packing them in. But where... 
Yeah, sure does. Compel them to come in. That's a good thought. But the part I don't understand is where it suffers violence. How does it suffer violence when you're putting people into it? Unless somebody's attacking it. Like something's attacking it. <laughs> yeah, amen. That's right. Put it on them. Anything you don't believe, anything you don't like, pack it off on the Jews in the tribulation. <laughs> it's them Jews. <laughs> Yep, yep, that's a good one. Amen. I'm glad, I'm, that's the reason I open it up like this, because I want to hear your thoughts. And boy, this brings out, see, we brought several good verses brought into this thing that I didn't have here. All right, now, I believe that in our verse here that we're looking at, verse 12, he said, The kingdom of heaven suffereth the violence, and the violent take it by four. My Schofield note, my Schofield Bible says, it has been much disputed, much more now, right? That the violence here is external as against the kingdom in the persons of John the Baptist and Jesus, or that considering the opposition of the scribes and Pharisees, only the violently resolute would press into it. Both things are true. The king and his herald suffered violence and this is a primary and greater meaning, but also some were resolutely becoming disciples. So Schofield says both those meanings are true, but he said the primary meaning is number two, where it said the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. They killed John the Baptist, they cut his head off, they killed Jesus, they crucified it, and the violent take it by force and press into it. Number three. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, brother. What I saw was Yeah. The kingdom of heaven would suffer violence. In other words, the herald of the kingdom would suffer violence. Yeah. And the king would suffer violence. But I wanted to switch gears then and yeah. say Jesus says the violent person coming back in Revelation 19 will take the kingdom of Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, because he's going to be violent. He's going to be violent. Now, a lot, of people, a lot of people don't like that word violence. They say, how could the Lord be violent? You know, because violent is a bad word in our day and time. But let me tell you something, brother. When he comes back in the Advent, he's going to be violent. Big time violent. He's going to tear up Jack, buddy. He, uh, he's going to blow this thing to smithereens. Burn the world up and a fire devoureth before him. So, uh, yeah, that's a good thought. That's a good way of looking at it. He switches gears in the middle of the verse. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. They killed Jesus. They killed John the Baptist. And the violent take it by force. That could be Christ coming back and taking over it by force. Or that could be a person being saved and pressing into it like we was uh, talking about a minute ago. Brother Danny? The only problem is the kingdom of heaven wasn't here then. And it could have been if they had accepted it, right? Yeah. So you reckon everything was in place for the kingdom to actually start then? Because it suffereth present tense, like you said. Right now. It had to be here before it suffered. That's right. Suffereth right then. And the violent take it by force. But that violent looks like like plural, not like one, like Jesus. Like violent, all the violent. Not a violent one, but the violent, you know, like a bunch of them. 
of course, we'll be with the Lord when He comes back and takes over. Well, that might be us there causing violence. We make that Rodney King right look like a uh, kids out in the backyard playing, brother. <laughs> all right, let's go on to verse 13 right quick. We're going to have to move on. For all the, lo- all the prophets and the law prophesied, that's Old Testament, until John. And if ye will receive it. In other words, the Lord knows it's going to be hard to swallow what he's getting ready to say. This is Elias, that's Elijah, which was for to come. Now they all knew that Elijah was going to come before the dra- dreadful day of the coming of the Lord. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now this brings up all kinds of things. This brings up reincarnation, brother. Uh, if John the Baptist was Elijah, then uh, Elijah was reincarnated. We don't believe in reincarnation. Uh, I mean, if the Lord did it, we believe in it. <laughs> but as uh, we don't believe in the modern day doctrine of reincarnation, of course. We believe it's pointing a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. But there's a problem here. Turn over to John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1. You just got through say, reading that Jesus Christ said that John was Elias. John chapter 1. When John first started preaching, they sent to ask him, verse 19. They started asking him, who art thou? In verse 19. And he confessed. This is John chapter 1 verse 20. And denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Then they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Jesus said he was. And he said he wasn't. You reckon he was and didn't know he was? Or you reckon he wasn't? And John didn't know what he's talking about or he's lying? Maybe he, wasn't he was and he wasn't. <laughs> Do what? Maybe he wasn't at that time. This is right when he first started preaching. Yeah, that's right. I'm getting ready to tell you what it is in a minute. Go ahead, brother. All right, let's go to Luke one seventeen. There's your contradictions all these people worry about all the time. See, people read stuff like that and they say, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Jesus said he's John, uh, he was Elijah and John said he wasn't Elijah. There's, no, the contradiction's in your brain. Just because you can't understand it don't mean there's a contradiction there. God's got enough sense to say what he means. John chapter, uh, Luke 1 what, brother? 117, Luke 117. There you go. And prophesying of John before he was born, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. But that ain't what Jesus said. He said he was Elias. Everybody knows Jesus said Elias was going to come first and then followed the saying that he's already come. No wonder the Lord said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now we know this. The last two prophets mentioned in the Old Testament are Moses and Elijah, right? The Lord said, I'll send you Moses and Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. We also understand by that that Moses and Elijah both show up in the middle of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 11. And they are beheaded just like John the Baptist was. They get their head cut off. Now, if John, if, if Elijah was here in the Old Testament and Elijah was here in John the Baptist and then Elijah's going to come again in the tribulation... You have the first coming of Elijah, the second coming of Elijah, and the third coming of Elijah. That's some wild stuff. What if you went to a camp meeting and the preacher got up and said, All right, I'm going to preach you a message on the third coming of Elijah. Everybody go, Good night. He's a heretic. But uh, he, he did. He was here in the Old Testament. John the Baptist came. Jesus said, "He'll like he, like he said, the angel said, the spirit and power of Elijah. And then he's going to show up in the middle of the tribulation. You say, hey, you know, that's Moses and Elijah. I've heard people say that's Enoch and Elijah. No way. Enoch is a type of the rapture in the Old Testament before the flood. He's one man in the Old Testament that didn't die and never will die. You say, well, he has to die because it's point on a man wants to die. No, no, everybody don't have to die. We're, if the Lord come right now, we'd go up in heaven and never die. Right? All right. Now, they get their head cut off in the tribulation. 
They come in the spirit. They come as Elijah. So we see that, like Brother Danny mentioned, John is a type, and the spirit, the power, the spirit of Elijah came in John the Baptist, and he already appeared in the New Testament. So that if the Jews, here we go again, if the Jews had accepted the message of the kingdom, the Old Testament scriptures would have been fulfilled. And Elijah would have come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Since they didn't accept him, John was only a type of Elijah and died, got his head cut off, and Elijah's going to come again in the middle of the tribulation during, uh, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So if John was Elijah... Israel would accept the kingdom. Had Israel accepted the kingdom, John would have been Elijah. And they could have accepted the kingdom. The tribulation would have begun in Acts chapter 7. The Old Testament prophecy would have been fulfilled. And the conversion of the Gentiles would have took place after that with Christ sitting on the throne. Instead of being in the church age with Christ in heaven. The word of God's not bound, brother. God will fulfill his word regardless of what men do or don't do and still not interfere with man's free will. All right? Any questions on that? That's some heavy stuff, ain't it? Any questions on that right there? Or comments? Don't be afraid. You say, well, Brother Danny, you're just all wrong and you're just out. Well, straighten me out. Let's hear it. He would have been, he would have fulfilled the scripture of Elijah. No, he was, he was in the spirit and power of Elijah. And just had, okay, it's just like this, Kelly. It's just like Judas is Antichrist, right? But it ain't really, Judas' spirit's going to come out of the pit and inhabit the Antichrist body. And so he's actually going to be Judas Iscariot. But he's really Henry Kissinger <laughs> or whoever he's going to be. Uh, so he, it's like this. He was and he wasn't. He was Elijah and he was John the Baptist. He was and he wasn't. That's one of them things that's hard to understand. You got to understand John the Baptist was kind of in a dispensation all by himself. He's a bridge. He wasn't like no normal man. He's a bridge from Old Testament to New Testament, from law to grace, from Gentile to Jew, from uh, law to, uh, to church. All right? Anybody else? I guess, I guess he would have fulfilled the scripture about Moses. I don't know. Like unto me. I reckon. I don't know. But Don... Yeah, there you go. There you go. The Mount of Transfiguration. There they was. They did come. So if the kingdom had been accepted, Moses and Elijah had done come. I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't know why. How do we overlook that? That Moses and Elijah was on the Mount of Transfiguration. So the fourth coming of Elijah is what I'm going to preach on Sunday. He come in the Old Testament. He come in John the Baptist. He come on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's coming back again in the Tribulation. Man, he got to come four times. Don't go out and be blabbing this all over town. Anybody else? Save up your love one. You'll be That's right. All right. We're going to stop there. Now, I hope the next time you read this scripture, you'll at least know a little bit more about it. You might be confuser and confuser. Amen. All right. Let's